Alright, welcome everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Um, I am back with a, another tutorial series, I guess. Um, I'm going to structure this one a little bit different than I did the Metroid one. I think I'm just going to create a whole bunch of different systems and then do like an overview of what the systems are and how they work. So for this particular video, I'm going to go over, let's go over here. Um, let's see here, I'm going to go over our state machines. So if you don't know what a state machine is, don't worry, you will <laughs> at the end of this video. Um, I'm going to show you how to tile up the ground. I'm going to show you how to water your little tiles. I'm going to show you how to fertilize your tiles. Come on, fertilize, and how to plant them. As well as if you are, I don't know, watered a couple of your tiles or whatever, you can also reset them. Now there's a little bit of a bug there, as you saw. Um, even the fertilized tiles also went away. But um, that is a bug for another day. And also how to grow your crops and take them without watering your plant, or your soil. <laughs> That's also a bug, but yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah. Let us, I guess, get started. All right, so where to begin? I guess we should just start off with the player. Um, that is probably the most complicated or complex thing that we actually have in the scene. Uh, the second being, I guess, obviously the the um, tile map, so I'll also do that one here in a second. But first things first. Okay, so the very first thing I did for the uh, character is I created a movement system. Again, if you watch the Metroid uh, video, then this should look familiar. If you haven't, don't worry about it. I'm going to go over it real quick. So I created a movement variable that's just going to store the vectors of the player. And then I created a speed variable, and that's just how fast she's gonna be going. Then I created a new function called uh, player movement in the process. Um, this is similar to the physics process, but um, since it's a top-down game and I don't plan on using any physics, I just use the process one. It does the exact same thing, except it doesn't use the physics engine, or uh, Godot's physics engine. So anyway, after that, I created the player movement. Um, I created a bunch of booleans. Um, left, right, up, and down, or left, right, down, and up. Um, all these are going to do is return back a 0 or a 1. 0 is false, 1 is true, and then I use that to, um, in the movement variables here with the uh, movement vector, and I just convert the boolean from, um, from a false or true statement to a 0 or a 1. In this case, um, whenever we're pressing it, it's going to give us a 1. If it's left, I want a negative 1. That way we move to the left of the screen. Um, and if we're going to the right, I want it to be a positive number because that's how Godot has its right, its left and right. And then the same thing is done with the y-axis, except um, I have uh, negative to go up and then I have positive to go down. And then here you can see if movement, meaning if movement is... Um, not null, then it's going to get a it's going to get our node or animation node, which I'll explain that in, in a little bit. And then it's going to check our direction, and then after that, it's going to manipulate our velocity vector. So it's going to get our x velocity, and it's going to multiply that x by speed, which in this case would be either one or negative one. If you remember in math, anytime you multiply a negative number, it will give you a negative number. And if you multiply a positive number, it gives you a positive number. So that's how that works. Same thing for the y-axis, um, except it's taking the up and down movement. And then else, um, if we're not moving at all, then that means we're standing still. We're going to get the animation node again. It's going to check our direction. And then it's going to give us velocity for both the x and y. And it's going to zero us, excuse me, it's going to zero us out. That way we stop moving. And then since... Oh wait, before I actually go into the animation node, I gotta explain this stuff here. Um, after that, we need to get our velocity. Um, we want to normalize our movement, that way we are not going faster when we're going in a diagonal. Um, all that's gonna do is make sure that when we're going in a diagonal like this, we're not faster 
then when we're going up and down, that's what normalize does. And then it needs to be multiplied this by the speed and the delta. That way, if our frame rate um, is jittery or whatever, it's it's consistent. The player's movement is consistent. And then speed, obviously, is how fast we're going to be going. And then we need to call the movement slide. That way, it um, knows that the velocity needs to be manipulated to show movement. All right. Now, to get the node uh, animation, I just, this is a animated sprite, if I remember correctly. Let me just hover over this. Yes, animated sprite 2D. So all I did for that is I added a script to this and created a bunch of little functions in here to do our animations. Obvious, I know, great explanation. Anyway, um, so the first thing I did was I got an on ready variable to the player node, which is get parent. All that's saying when you say get parent is whatever the top node is within this tree, get it. And then after that, I wanted to get the animation player, which is this little purple box down here, which I think, yeah, it's the animation player. Um, that way I can call them later. And then I want as a default for our current direction to be idle. So whenever the game starts, it will instantly give us the idle position. Then on the ready function, um, I have it called this um, animation player and then it's gonna play a animation here. Don't worry about this. Um, this controls this little box here and I'll explain what that box is in a moment. So don't worry about that. As that, I went into the process function and created an animation loop. Uh, use the exact same variables that I had in the movement. Um, I put a little note in here for the dryer principle, which is don't repeat yourself. I re did this in the other video, um, but this was just easier. So I just copied all the variables that I had in the movement and I pasted them here with one little caveat and that is the happy. That was for the uh, celebration jump that you saw in the little teaser trailer. So. All these buttons are gonna do is just, um, when they're pressed, they're gonna change my current direction, and then they're going to get my animation node. Right? Yeah, it's gonna get the anim node. I don't know why I did that. That makes no sense. It shouldn't need to get that. It honestly should just be play. Because we're in, right? Yeah, we're, because we're in the actual node itself. So I don't know why I wrote these. I, if I remember correctly, I think I got these for, let me see something. <laughs> these should still work. Yeah, again, I don't know why I, I did that. Okay, whatever. Stupid me being stupid, all right. So we don't need to um, get those nodes there. Um, since we are, since we have a script attached to the animation player, or the, uh, not the animation player, the uh, animated script, I can just play the animations directly. So all I have to do is press play. So if I'm moving up, play the up animation, go down. Give me a second here, where's the up animation? Up, walk, ah, here we go. Play the up animation. And then, you know, down, play down animation, left, right, you get the idea. And then it changes the current direction to whatever that direction is. That way, if we're ever not moving, which is in this one here, the check direction, if you remember here in um, the player movement, as I just went over, we did have this get node check direction. So I passed in the variables of true and false. So if I'm moving, that means I'm moving is true. If I'm not moving, then I have it as false. And it's gonna read that whenever this is called. So it's gonna ask, is moving? So am I moving? If I'm not moving, then all I want to do is get the current direction. If the current direction is whatever this is, I want you to grab this particular animation. So these are all for the idle animations whenever we're not moving. So if the last direction that I was at was up, it's gonna get the up idle animation. That way it creates the illusion that she stopped moving. Otherwise, if you don't do this, um, she's just gonna run in place um, with every direction that you have. Same thing for any celebrations or custom animations, you need to um, 
store a variable for the, that as well. And I think that's about it for that. It's not too complicated. If any of this stuff is complicated, or you don't understand, feel free to leave a comment. I'll, uh, I usually answer most of those comments. Okay. Next up, I said I was going to explain what the f the strike box was. So, what the strike box is, as the player is moving around, I need I needed a way for her to be able to collide with the tile map, the tile map itself, as well as whoops, with tile map itself, as well as follow where she's going. So, all I did was I created or I added the animation player and then I created a bunch of little animations depending on which direction she's facing this little this little um, strike box would go into that direction and all I did was just animate it using zoom the positions so how that works is you just go here new animation after you you know what let's just do this add the node animation player you click on that, you put create. Then after that, you go here, animation, you put new. I'm just gonna call delete. And then you can just add the track property. And then it's gonna ask you what it is that you wanna animate. In this case, I chose the strike box. If I remember correctly, was it the strike box or was it the collision shape? Give me one second while I figure that out. Okay, it was both the collision shape and the strike box. Okay, whatever. So I added this, added a property. I said I added a property track. Went in, got my strike box, and then asked me what I want to move to uh, animate. That was the position. And I did the exact same thing again for the collision shape. If I remember correctly, it gave me an error, which is why I had to add both of these. And then after that, I just grabbed the node itself and then I look through here and look for its transform and I just, I just hit a little little key uh, that's on here on the side here and you can see it popped up and then I did the exact same thing for this transform wherever I wanted it you know let's say I want it over here and then I hit the keyframe and then it saved it and then whenever it plays it's going to take this uh, sprite box or this um, collision shape and it's going to move it to wherever I said I don't need this, so I'm just gonna delete it. Yes, delete, delete, delete. And again, that's why, that way I can, um, you know what, well, I guess I'll show you. The reason why I did that was for visible collisions, just, as you can see here, this little strike box here has the position of where the uh, soil is going to end up, as well as what, where you can water. And you can see, as I move around, the collision box or that that strike box is also changing its position. So that's why I did that. That, that way, um, I didn't have to write code for it. Okay. Now, finally, finally, the most difficult part out of them all was the state machine. Now, I did not know how to do a state machine before doing this little tutorial. So I looked up a couple of videos. Give me one second. So I looked up a couple of videos and tried to figure out how I can make a state machine because um, while I was trying to change, while I was trying to change tiles, Jesus Christ, um, I realized that trying to do everything inside the tile map made things super duper messy. So I decided to go with a state machine. That way we can just read what state the player is currently in and then manipulate the map depending on what the state of the, the player was currently in, if that makes sense. So all a state machine is essentially is uh, pretty much what it says. It's just going to check the state of what the player is currently, and then depending on that state, it's going to do whatever the hell we tell it to. All right, so first thing first, I created a node. So add child, and it was just a normal ass node like this. And then I just called it state machine, and then I attached the script to it. 
So what I knew that I needed um, was I needed to know what the current state was. I needed to know what the previous state was. That way I can always uh, call back to any previous states that I had. And then I need to know what the next state was. Now, if I'm not mistaken, did I use that for anything? I don't think I did, to be 100% frank with you. It says one of three. Yep, never used it. Okay, I'm just going to ignore you. <laughs> Alright, so I just need a current state and a previous state. No next state needed. And then after that, I created um, an enum of all the states that I wanted. Now, what an enum does is it allows me to store a bunch of different variables. And it's always going to be numbers, no matter no matter what. So none is actually zero, till is actually one, water is two, plant is three, and fertilizer is four. Um, and then after that, um, I created a list and I stored all of those states in here. Now the reason why I did that is because computers are actually very good at crunching numbers um, instead of strings. So I wanted to make sure that I could identify what these variables were, as well as call them very quickly. So the reason why I shoved them into a list is so I can actually call them. For whatever reason, you can't call them directly from the uh, uh, enums um, without them being a string. I kind of wanted them as numbers. That way I can do addition and subtraction. That way the states would change. So that's why I did that. So I created uh, an enum, gave all the states that I wanted, then I stored those states into a list that I can later call, and depending on which element I called in there, would change the state. And then down here, um, this is another list full of strings. Don't worry, I didn't, I'm not a hypocrite. This is um, for the HUD display that's down here. Um, whoops, let me uh, get rid of this debug mode. This uh, list here is just for this, so whenever I'm into a state, it can just read off the right off the ripper <laughs> which state that is. Um, the HUD that I used, which is right here, is a rich text label, and it can only read strings. So um, I just decided to use strings because it was easy. All right, so the first thing that the state machine does is whenever the hell it's called, or whenever the player enters the scene, it's gonna get a current state. Now, I have it set to null as default. That way it can execute some code for me. So if the state is equal to null, which it should be, then I wanna equal the current state or change the current state to the very first element in the states list. And that state should be all states dot none, which would be zero, if you remember, because um, the all states here, or the enums, or all numbers. And then after that, um, I have a process function here, which calls every frame, and it's going to get my current, my current um, state, the player's current state, and then it's going to return it. But um, I'm I'm checking every uh, every frame. Um, that way, the other nodes, because this is actually going to be called in the other states. So they can change. And then here, it's going to get the child of the state machine. It's going to find out what state I'm in. So if I'm in zero, it'll be none, till, water, plants, and fertilizer, depending. So that's zero, one, two, three, and four. And then it's going to get a function within that node or that state. And it's going to pass it to them so they know what state we're currently in. I hope that's making sense. So it's gonna get this. It's gonna get the child dependent on what state it's in. So let's just say since we just started, we're gonna be in zero, and then it's gonna get a function that's in none. So I'm gonna go right here, and it's gonna pass that state to it. So you can see here, get current state. Here's the current state, and I have a variable up here called player state. It's gonna be equal to null, and then I want it to return the player state. And what this is going to do is it, whenever this is called, it's going to find out what this state is from the state machine, from the state machine, and it's gonna change it to that state. And then here, um, this is gonna be called somewhere else. It's gonna get a, our tile map and it's gonna get our tile data. Don't worry about that for right now. 
but um, once this is called and it has that that information there it's gonna look through the code and say if we're in state one which is the till state so we can till land and the tile is equal to in this case will be grass just regular grass if those two are true anytime I press the uh, spacebar I want to change the tile map to all this so don't worry about any of this right now I'm gonna explain that later when I get to the tile map because that enters that code but I'm just right now explaining um, why I have this set up here so this is is to pretty much automate it because all of these states have the exact same method written in there as you can see here still has the state has to get the current state so this stuff here again changes that state it's gonna read it and then it's gonna allow me to do something depending on these conditions and that goes for the same for the plant again same thing enter player state it's gonna find it and fertilizer does the exact same thing so that way we can just go through each and every single one of these um, dependent on what the state is it's gonna look for that particular one because they all have the exact same um, function name as well as the exact same parameter and that allows me to just press a button and it just runs nice and smooth next up I have is a get next state this is actually called in the input function now this input function is built in um, it reads um, the key button presses that you have on your keyboard I think it also works on like controllers but I, I don't quote me on that I don't know I've never tried it so <laughs> but anyway um, when I press either the N key or the home key it's either going to go up on the the the, the it's gonna change the state to um, god damn it it's gonna change the state in a plus one fashion so it's gonna go forward in the list and if I press the home it's gonna go backwards in the list depending on where I'm at um, so first thing it's gonna do is gonna check what the current state is and if the current state is less than the size of the of the um, of this list here then it's gonna run this code now the reason why I have minus one in here is because um, I don't want this to ever go over I don't want the current state to ever go over the list because if it does it's gonna cause um, it's gonna cause problems like uh, I think it was skipping the very last one so I could never get to the fertilizer um, state so that's why I have that in there and then anyway um, once you have once it, this thing is checked and it's um, not going over or whatever um, it's gonna take the value or the variable of previous state and whatever our current state is um, it's gonna store it in there and then we're gonna change our current state to um, an element within the states list that we have created here so and then yeah it's gonna change it into uh, one of the elements that we have in the state list using the previous um, state that we were in now remember these states are numbers so let's say for example since we started off um, let's just say we, we just entered the game right now um, these are gonna be zero so what it's gonna say is uh, when I press this button, it's going to say current state, or excuse me, it's going to say previous state is equal to current state. So previous state is equal to zero, and then the current state is going to change to zero on, in the list plus one. So it's going to be here, and then we're going to go to plus one, and then we're going to move it to here because we have the previous list state, uh, the previous state saved so we can use it. And then if we ever go over this list, we're just going to bounce back. So all this is doing, if you look right here, like I said, our previous list. Now this isn't even called yet until I press the uh, the uh, button to to call this. But what this is doing is essentially just keeping me here. It's getting my last state, and when I press the button, it's allowing me to go forward one. And then if it ever goes over, so this is the last. Um, element in the list which is what this is, is checking it's gonna call this else function first or, or it's gonna call this um, Jesus Christ man I am struggling to, to, to speak today <laughs> um, once it reaches that that freaking end uh, of the list 
it's going to double back over and bring it back to the first element. Okay, and then the previous, uh, or the very next function after that, is just get previous. It pretty much is the exact same thing, but just in reverse order. Literally, it's just making sure that um, we're not the first element. As long as we're not the first element, we can go backwards. And if we are the first element, and we press backwards, send us to the top of the list. So in other words, if I'm at none, it should bring me to fertilizer, or the fertilizer uh, state. Um, these are, what was this for? Okay, and then here was just me testing. Um, I'm probably gonna have like actual buttons on the, uh, the screen that the player can press, but as of right now I have a uh, UI down, UI up, and all this does is allow me to swap between the till mode and water mode on the fly. So as you'll see here, if I press up, it gives me water, press down, gives me till, instead of having to go to, instead of me having to go through all this like that. So that was just so I can test it out and make sure that that stuff worked. Okay. And then this last one here, get current um, state name, that was just used for the uh, the HUD, which is right here in the rich text uh, label, that way you can read. All it's doing is, whoops, is that correct? There we go. All it's doing here is uh, getting my state machine here, and then it's just taking that text and just getting whatever fires off from here, which is what was from that list. So, so yeah, that's... So yeah, yeah. So that's how the state machine works. Um, I don't think I was too confusing on that, but um, yeah. Like I said, don't worry. I'm gonna go through each and every single one of these little doohickeys in a second. Um, that way I can explain exactly what one each one does when it's actually in that state. But I need to explain the tile map first. Speaking of tile map, I think now would be a great time to go there. <laughs> okay. So, oh, I, I guess I should mention this now. Um, one of the benefits for having a state machine, by the way, like this, is it's not dependent on the tile map as I had before previously, as you'll soon see right here. There's not going to be a tile map here. But um, the game does not crash, and despite me going to these modes, the game does not crash. It doesn't. It doesn't care because none of those functions are being met, or those um, none of those conditions are being met. So we are free. Home stretch. Okay. So next up, let's go to the tile map. Our bestest friend. Where am I at? Actually, in recording time. Twenty-eight minutes. Awesome. Okay, so the first thing I did for the tile map, um, let me go to here first, actually, yeah, um, I created the tile map, I know what you freaking do, I created a bunch of tile maps, or tile sets, for me to use, so I have a dry soil, a wet soil, soil with fertilizer on it, a whole bunch of random um, tiles for the world itself, and then um, soil that's both fertilized and wet. And I used all those to create this little map here. Now the player actually has access to these four um, tile sets here in their code. Um, I'll explain how you grab those in a second. But um, let me go and explain some of the code that's inside here. Alright, let me see how I want to structure this. I just want to see what's going on here. Okay, so I figured out how to dry out soil, find my current state, check the soil type, get the mouse position. Alright. Okay, so one of the things I did for the tile map is I needed to get the player strike box. Um, that way, when they're on this particular tile map, they can I can get the position of any tile that I want to be changed. And then after that, I also got the player state machine. That way, we could make sure um, the tile 
the tile map could read what the state currently was and allow us to do things to the tile map, dependent if the player was in that state or not. So, yeah, I got these at um, on ready variables, that way I can get them right off the bat. Um, I don't remember what this was for, I think that was uh, for testing. Uh, don't worry about this, I'll explain why I have that here in a second, or a little bit later down the line. So, one of the first things I did was I created a brand new enum for all the soil types that I have. Um, I guess I should say all the uh, tile types that I'm going to have, but whatever. So we have grass, which is 0, dry, which is 1, watered soil, which is 2, fertilizer, which is 3, and so on and so forth. I didn't get the idea. And then I, again, took this list and put it in here. That way I can uh, shuffle through it dependent on... Um, dependent on particular conditions. Alright, so the first thing I did, uh, this isn't important. I had that there just to, there were some bugs that I was having to fix, so don't worry about that. That's just make sure that I can actually get the uh, tile machine, or the, uh, the state machine. Um, here down the highlight cell, um, this allowed me to highlight the particular cells when the player created a tile. Um, as you can see here, it doesn't really matter where I put the tile. It just allows me to grab um, any of the soil tiles. That way the player knows um, it know, they know which tiles are interactable or they have an interactable object. All I did was I created a variable for the mouse position which was uh, get viewport down get mouse position and then I created a condition saying I need it to get the cell type data and I need it to get it from layer 1. If I remember this, how this works, let me just quickly check. Yeah, look for the layer. So the, the layer one, um, I guess I'll, I'll explain uh, the layers here in a minute. Um, so get the tile data from layer one and then the mouse position. Um, if it had layer one, um, then we were going to get the highlighter, which is not here. It is right here. It's just outside the screen. Whoops, whoops a doodle. Um, get that, if you, we weren't in any type of tile that was on layer one, then we were just gonna hide it. And then after that, I want to get the position of the highlighter or that sprite. And then I want it to convert it um, to the size of the tile. That way, when we are hovering over the, um, when we're hovering over the tile, it only, it will highlight the actual tile map itself, or the actual little tile th itself, instead of it being all wonky, like being off centered and stuff. So this allowed it to go right in the center of the tile map, or the tile sprite? Yeah, the tile sprite that we have here for each of the soil ones. And it actually works for the, um, for the other tile types as well, such as the fertilized one, the watered one, and the planted soil. Whoops, let's not fuck this up. Okay, and then the mouse position, which you saw here as a parameter that it was asking for. This was asking for the actual position, which was a vector 2, if I remember correctly. Right? Tile map. Yeah, it's looking for coordinates of a vector 2. Um, I, chose, I told it to get the, um, the mouse position. And this mouse position is just being converted to the the same as the position of the highlighter so that way it goes um 16 by 16 and then it changes over once it it reaches that threshold that way we don't have any wonkiness going on with um, um the highlighter being all centered okay <clears throat> not very important i know but i thought it was a cool feature um, wait, I said I was going to explain something. Oh yeah, the layers. Okay, so when I was creating my little tile maps, I decided that it would be best... Um, so when I added this here, I decided that it would be best to have different layers for the ground and then the interactable layers. So all I did was I created a layer in the layers panel here. So when you click on the uh, tile set here, you'll get a whole bunch of information that you can you can use. Um, oh, it looks like it's not even in there. <laughs> Never mind. Um, but anyway, you'll get you'll find the uh, layers in the tile set panel somewhere. 
and I decided that I would just use two different layers. One would be ground, which would be pretty much all of this tile map that you see. And then the soil would be it on its own layer. And this layer would be the, um, the one whatever the player would interact with. To, such as putting uh, the tile map and stuff on there. You can see that... Let me see, I think it would be in tile map here. You can see the soil. You, everything that's black is where it's, um, is on another layer. And then everything that's highlighted is the current layer that it's on. So, you can see here, all this tile map here is on ground. And then here, if I were to do that, you can see that it's, it's, it's lighter. But if I were to go back to the ground, you can see that it's darkened up. I'm just going to get rid of that because I don't want that there. It will definitely cause problems, trust me. But anyway, yeah. So that's how the uh, the mouse is actually working. So it's just finding out what's on layer one, and if it's on layer one, it's um, if it's on layer one, then it allows the highlight. Okay. Next thing that I did was find current state. So I created a function, find current state. I created a variable called current state, and then I went and I got the, the state machine, and I called this function, get current state. If you remember, go down here, get current state, returned a variable, and that state, um, that variable was whatever the state was. And we are going, or I decided to use that, go back to the tile map here, to change um, to change the, the state, state of, of the player. player. So, as you can see here, get player state machine, which is all the way up here. So all I said was um, get parent, get node. So, in here it said get the parent, which is this farm node, and then look through it and find the player, which I named Coletta. <clears throat> Excuse me, Coletta. And then find the node that's attached to her called state machine. And then after you found that, I want you to get a child of that state machine, which, again, would be either none tail water, plant, or fertilizer, depending depending on what state we're in. So remember, that state is going to be a number. So um, let's say since we just started the game, so we'll be on state zero. And then after that, I want you to call the function enter. I want you to get the tile map. As you can see here, I want you to get the tile map. And then I also want you to get the type of tile um, that we're currently um, on top of, or the strike box is currently on type of, uh, top of. And you'll see that in here. It says tile data, whatever that tile data number is, will be, in this case, it'd be a zero. And then it, all that's telling. Um, I think this is till, right? Yes, this is the till state. I don't think the none state has anything in it, right? Oh, the none state, I never I never programmed for it. I just copied the uh, till state. Gotta fix that, but anyway. Um, don't worry, I'm gonna show you how do you, you can get the tile data here as well. Um, but anyway, it's gonna say, if the player state is one, so we're in the till state, and um, and the tile data is equal to zero, then we're allowed to, to change the map. Set cells terrain connect do all this stuff again don't worry i'm going to explain what exactly this code does in just a second but i want to finish explaining this um anyway before i can even do that i have to explain what the tile data is but um yeah so that's what this is doing so it's just going in it's going into the state machine it's getting one of the tiles dependent on what the state is because um that's what the state machine is doing and then it's going to find whatever its entered function is it's going to pass in the tile map and then it's going to find out what tile we currently are in. As you can see here, tile type list. It's going to find out if it's a grass, dry soil, water soil, fertile, whatever the hell that we put in there. And then, depending on that, it's going to allow us to either till the land or water it or whatever it is that we decided that state would do. Okay, now to explain how you would get the tile data. <clears throat> All right. Full disclosure. 
I do not, uh, I do not just figure this out myself. I looked up a couple of other, t uh, other YouTubers to see exactly how to grab the uh, tile data from the, the tile, uh, the tile map. Uh, I didn't quite use their methods um, because their methods were, I don't want to say wonky, but they didn't suit my needs. But I did learn how to um, grab the data from them anyway. So. Yeah, I will probably leave um, their videos in the description if you want to go further into it. Um, I think one was, you know, I don't even remember their names. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I did not come up with this. Just, just full disclosure. So when we want to check to see what the tile um, is currently on, we need to create custom data um, on the tile map itself. So I'm gonna go to the uh, I gotta go to the farm because it's um it's its own separate entity. <sighs> okay. So if you go into the tile set here, you're gonna see a bunch of little nice little functions here or little drop down menus. The one that I needed was custom data layers, and this allowed me to identify which tile um, I was currently looking at by assigning it a number. So I just created a brand new variable in here like this, add element, then I named it something uh, super cool, like whatever. And then I chose the type that I wanted it to be, an integer, because numbers are fun. And then depending on what that integer was, would tell me what type of tile I was currently looking at. So all I did, once that was added, um, you go to select and then you select the tile that you want and then after you've added this um, Thing here This little drop down where it says custom data should pop up and when it pops up you should be able To add numbers to this and this is going to be an identifier of what or an ID of what this tile is So in my particular case this entire tile set that's here. I want it one to represent dry soil. Anything that was zero represented grass, as you can see here. So these were things that I could dig up and change with the, um, I can change with the uh, dry soil. So once you have all that um, set up, you can then create this function right here. Uh, to collect it or to get that data, but first um, it needs a collision shape shit. I've completely forgot you'll you'll need also a physics layer a physics layer Jesus Christ So um, make sure you add a physics layer have this on and then whatever tile that is um, I think this one has it like this right yeah <coughs> Excuse me um, Whatever uh, tile that you want to interact with make sure it has a physics layer uh thingamadaga collider on it and then you're good to roll then after that um, we need to go back to Coletta and we need to go to her strike box and in the strike box um, which is an area 2d there is a special signal that we need to use and that is body shape entered um, with all this crazy stuff in it I don't know what any of that other stuff does I just know that I need it um, the one for the body. For whatever reason, um, the regular enter body doesn't work, but this one does. Um, again, don't know what that, why that is. It just happened to be that way. So anyway, um, once you're in the area 2D, um, click on this and then hit connect, and then it's going to give you a brand new function down here called on body shape entered. And then it's going to give you a whole bunch of little parameters in here. The only one that you need is the body. For, for this particular thing. Give me one second, I am thirsty as a hell. <clears throat> Becoming a damn alcoholic, drinking all this water. <clears throat> okay. So anyway, um, so all this one is doing is checking on which bodies are colliding. So all I'm saying is whatever the body that's colliding with the area 2D has a function 
of check soil type and then we're going to pass in the body so if you look at here this check soil type is the exact same name that we had here and then here it's just checking the collided tile map <clears throat> the collided tile map so here I created a for loop and I just wanted to check what was inside that um, what was inside the collided tile map so I just said 4x in collided tile map I want to get the layers counts because I have more than one layer so I want to check all the layers and then after that I want you to create a variable that I can use to store uh, the collided map, uh, the collided tile maps, um, tile data, which is going to be the one, the two, the three, whatever. This here, this X is going to be the layer that it's getting. So um, in this case, it's going to get both zero. It's going to go. It's going to get both the ground layer and the soil type layer. Then it's going to get the player box position, and this here, this player strike box position here, box position. Excuse me, is here so it's going to get the player box position it's going to get the node the strike box and then it's going to look for this function here as you can see here it's going to find tiles um, so we're going to pass in the tile map with this and then after that we're going to get the coordinates so wherever it's at currently we want those coordinates and then we want it to return so that way um, that way it knows uh, which tile we're currently um, we're currently on top of so it's going to it's going to store that and then this here is if this data tile isn't empty or isn't null means we have a tile that we can we were interacting with i want you to store whatever that type of data is by its layer id in this case we uh, i think i think there was only one um, so that would be the soil type and then after that I need you to save it in the top way up here remember here transfer tile data I save it up here that way I can use it in other areas inside the script and it needs a default value of zero or it needs a default value I say that it doesn't have to be zero it could be a thousand if you want but um, I just chose zero um, because it was the grass tile by default so and then after we have the um, this particular data we could use it in our state machines to figure out which tile we're currently um, standing on and depending on what that tile is will allow us to do certain things such as you know till the land water it put fertilizer plant uh, build a snowman whatever whatever it is that you want to do um, that's why um, or that's how you would do it. I hope that what I just said made sense because it took me like four days to figure this out. <laughs> so anyway, again, if you don't understand it, just leave me a message and I will come to your rescue. Hopefully. Okay. So I think that takes care of the tile map. I don't think there's anything else in here that I need to go over with the exception of drying out the soil um, and all that is is just replacing all these the tiles um, with the dry tiles but um, I'm gonna explain that here in just a second because this is a what do you call it this is a crazy ass beast but anyway um, yeah you know what, actually, I guess I'm going to have to explain it now because um, I just explained how the state machine and tiles work, so. <laughs> yeah, great. Alright. I have dreaded this day. Alright. Alright. Alright, alright, alright. So, in tile maps, there are two nifty little functions in here that we can use to change the tiles that we are currently looking at depending on a myriad of factors. Um, some of the common things that you'll need are the coordinates and you're going to need a layer. Now when I was doing the so when I was doing the the soil as you can see here it 
dynamically changes depending if there's tiles around it or not. That way they all don't look like little squares like this. So I'm gonna just quickly order this. As you can see here, that way it doesn't all look like that. They dynamically change. I don't know yet how to get these to dynamically change with um, the other tiles. Uh, it's a work in progress, like I said, so at one point or another, when I figure that out, I'll show you, but as of right now, I at least figured out how to do the um, dry soil. Which brings me into terrains. So the only way that you can do the dynamic shifting of tiles is with set tiles of terrain. And the way you set that up is, in the tile map, there is a, another nifty little feature right here called terrains. Wait a minute. Okay, good. Here we are. Called terrains. Now, you saw that in there. Don't worry about this just yet. I don't remember if I even used that. But um, in here, in your little tiles, you can see that there is a feature here called terrains and it has some data in here. Now that data can be accessed and manipulated in the tile set and then you will go here and you will see a bunch of tile sets or you will see when you drop down the, the menus it says add element and then you can do whatever. So in this particular case when you add an element you're adding a brand new terrain. And depending on that terrain, um, on what you want it to do, how can I explain this? Give me a second here. All right, so in set terrains, you can create um, tiles that are are dynamic, right? Depending on what you want to match, so you can either match corners and sides, corners or sides. In this case, I use sides. Um, again, full disclosure, I did not come up with this method. Um, I just followed somebody else's little tutorial. Um, but I needed it to do other things. So, I didn't copy it 100%. But anyway, um, once you open this thing up, you can add an element, name it something. So in this case, I, I named it dry soil. And then I added a color. And then when I did this, if you go into your tile set and you click on paint, you're going to see a select property editor and terrains. Now the way terrains work is it's going to ask you for a particular terrain set. In this particular case, it's, I only have one, which is um, this element right here that we're looking at. And then it's going to ask for which terrain that you want. In this particular case, I chose dry. And now it's going to ask me to essentially paint on this. So I'm going to close all this off and explain exactly what the f these mean and <coughs> excuse me, what the hell these mean and um, why I have to paint them like this. So the way this is working is when you set up terrains the tiles are going to be looking to see if there are any tiles around it and depending on how you paint it this um, if there's a tile within any of those directions, it's going to mold itself into another set that you want. So in this particular case, if you look really closely, I have a line here. And this line tells me that this is an end of the soil. So what I'm going to want to do is i got to click on the, the middle. That tells the, this tells the Godot that I want this tile. And then I'm going to click on the sides of it here, like so. And all this is saying is that if there's a tile here, here, or here, this tile should be called. And the same thing goes for here. So if there's a tile here, here, or here, I need this tile called. If there's a tile um, right next to this one, then this tile is called. And so on and so forth. So here, um, this is the standard one. Um, uh, not standard one. This is the one that's all encompassed. So if there's a tile on each of its sides, this is the tile that should be that should be placed here. And then this is the standard one. So if there are no tiles around it at all, then this is the tile that should be called. And it just keeps going like that. So um, I think I did the same for the water. Um, but 
it didn't seem to work so I don't know what the issue with that is but yeah so once you get this thing set up um, once you get this thing set up properly give me a second here if you call it I think it's in the till when we call it so we get the tile map and then we call this method that it has all I'm saying is I need you to go to layer one I need you to find the position of the strike box with inside that tile map and I want you to change it this I believe is the the terrain set give me one second here I need to figure out which one um, Okay, so what it's going to ask for is it wants the layer, then it wants the cells, the the um, the position of where it's currently at within the um, within that tile map. Then it wants to know what terrain set we're using. In this case, we're using the terrain set of zero, and you can see it right here. I chose zero, and then after that, it wants to know which terrain we're, we're going to be using. In that case, we're going to be using terrain zero again, because this is the first one that we have here. So this is zero, one, two, and three. So all this is saying is, if the player state is equal to one, and the terrain tile is grass, remember grass is zero, and we have uh, and we've pressed the input of the spacebar get the tile map and I want you to set the terrains using set the cells using the terrains um, that are connected and I want you to use it on layer one I want you to grab what position this box is in that's on the tile map and then I want you to use terrain set zero and I want you to use the very first um, the very first terrain that we'll create it in that case would be the dry soil and then I don't remember this falses falses probably nothing important ignore empty terrains yeah um, I didn't want it to ignore anything that was empty okay I think that covered that so if you did that correctly when you do this you should be able to have whoops dynamic dynamic uh, tiles for at least the soil that way they they connect like this again I think I could probably do the same thing with water one but I don't remember uh, why it wasn't working there was a reason for that but I don't remember what it is and then um, I'm gonna show you as you can see here the the water um, the water functions or changes the tile but it keeps the shape of the soil that is currently on and then the same thing is done with the fertilizer. So if the fertilizer is dry, excuse me, if the soil is dry, then the fertilizer will go on dry soil. And if it's wet, it will go on wet soil. So we're gonna go right through that real quickly. It's essentially the same as this, but instead of terrains, I use set cell. So let's go to Coletta. We're gonna go to the water tile thingy, Madaga. Let me get some more water. Okay. <clears throat> now, as you can see here. All right. So as you can see here, um, when the um, water, when the water uh, state is called, player two, uh, the player state is equal to two. That's the water state, and the tile is equal to one. This is dry soil. Uh, remember, because that's what we added in the custom data. It's going to, um, if those two are true, if we ever press the spacebar, what it needs to do is it needs to get the current um, tile atlas. And all that is, all the tile atlas is, uh, all the tile atlas is, is what position in the tile set um, that the tile is currently on. So in this case, you can see here I'm hovering over, it says Atlas coordinates is zero, zero. If I go down here, it says one, one, here, three, two, 
so for so on and so forth. So what I did was um, these three tile sets right here, they're all the same with just slight variations. So all of those atlas coordinates are all shared. So this tile here, the one that has um, no tiles around it, this is the one that it would be called. You can see it's in the exact same sp space no matter which tile set I call. And because I, I did it like that, um, if I store if I store that position um, before I change it, I can use that old position for my new position within a different tile set. So it looks like I've changed the tile, um, or it looks like I've, I've watered it or put fertilizer on it, even though what I'm actually doing is I'm just taking the tile from another uh, tile map that has the exact same coordinates, and I'm just plopping it right in, on top of it. So as you can see here, so I'm getting the old coordinates from the old tile that I was currently on. So let's say dry soil. Let me get out of this. And let me get out of the physics. I don't want physics. Set up. So, so let's say I'm on the dry tile, right? And I want to cause this one wet. So I'm going to get those, those coordinates, coordinates right, right here, here, which, which is, is one, one, one. I'm, I'm going to store them. them. And, and then later, I want to get the tile map. And then I want to set a new tile on the, the same layer. I want it to get the position on the tile map that the uh, box is on. Then I need to get the source. In this case, because it's dry and this is going to be water, I need to get source right here, source one. As you can see here, that's the source. And then the current tile atlas, uh, or the current yeah, the current tile atlas is which tile in here that I want to grab. In this case, it would be one one, because that's what this tile was before. And that will change the uh, tile to what? Or to a water tile, and then the same thing goes for here. But this one here is if the dry store, uh, the, if the soil um, is dry but it has fertilizer, so it does the exact same thing. It gets that that the tile that it was currently on, or the, and within the atlas, it stores it. And then I'm just saying change that tile from one on. Or excuse me, change that tile to layer one. Get the position of the strike box on that tile map. Change the source to five which is right here, hover, source 5, and then I want those coordinates from that tile right there, 1, 1, which is the same as this one, 1, 1, and the same as this one, 1, 1, as well as this one, 1, 1, and they all share those same coordinates, so all we're doing is, is the swapping them out. Okay, what am I doing on time? Probably not good. Yeah, we're at an hour. <laughs> I love it. All right. I think I've explained everything with the exception of planting. So let's just do that very quickly. We're going to go into the plant here. And then I need to go into the tiles here. So what I did here, I added um, on the tile map, I added a node, all plants. And all this is going to do is, is um, whenever we plant something, we're going to have it add it to here. That way it stores it in a list. Give me a second here. I don't know why it's doing all this weird, no weird nonsense. But let me go to the plant state. So, yeah, this is the right one. Right? Yeah. So, whenever we um, plant something, we want it to go into uh, this little plant node. That way, um, later down the line, we can just go through this list and change the plants accordingly um, to whatever we need to. So we we'll always have access to it as long as they're within this um, list. Okay, so in the plant state, all it's looking for is if the, if the soil is plantable. So in here, I created a quick little list of tile, uh, tile data. So if the tile data is either one, two, three, or five, so this represents um, dry soil, water soil, uh, dry fertilized soil, and wet fertilized soil. Um, looks like I might miss one. Don't I need four? I think I need four too. Give me one second here. Dry soil, fertilized soil. Fertilized. Yeah, yeah, I need one more. My mistake. Yeah, I thought that was a bit weird. So if it's any of these um, tiles here, one, two, three, four, or five, that means that it's plantable. Again, I got the strike box, and then I got a plant seed. All the plant seed is is a
all that is is a scene it's got a little uh, plant here it's got a collision shape and this is what is this this is just a regular old texture yeah and then we've got the art animation so depending on how old the plant is whoops let's not fuck this up so depending on how old the plant is it will grow so that's all that's doing let me go back to plant state so all it's saying is if the plant if the player state is equal to three that means that we're in the plant state and the plantable soil is uh, has this tile data so if this tile data is equal to one two three four or five then it's plantable and I press the spacebar it's going to get the tile map it's going to change it as it did before um, all this is the same stuff again this is just the source this is the, the, the coordinates that it's looking for and then out of that it's going to grab um, that scene it's going to instantiate it so make a copy of it and then it's going to plant it as you can see here get the tile map get the node all plants yeah get the node all plants and then add a child to it so now this tile map has a list of the plants that we planted and then after that it's going to put the position on the tile map wherever that box was the the, uh, the strike box and then that's the end of that now like I said this is not perfect um, there are definitely a lot of bugs within here for example I shouldn't be able to dig in the grass here as you can see at the tall grass it doesn't let me do it but if I position myself well enough let's see if I can do it you can see it lets me um, sometimes it lets me um, <laughs> create tiles on there we go it allows me to create tiles on tile uh, it allows me to create soil on tiles that I shouldn't be able to create soil on so there's one bug um, earlier bug I showed you was when it was watered it doesn't it doesn't affect the terrains for whatever reason and then the plant uh, the plant I can plant as many as I like so never stops and I can also plant a multitude of them so there you go I'm gonna make them grow as you can see here I just started growing more so I gotta have a way to stop that but um, yeah um, I think uh, you can see that's more bugs happening <laughs> But yeah, um, this is just a work in progress at the moment. So I know people want things like like pest and uh, I think a fountain, not a fountain, a what is the other thing? A sprinkler system. That's what it was. Um, so yeah, I'll get to those next. Um, like I said, this is a lot of information. If there's anything in here that, um, like I said, you don't understand. I know I kind of just skimmed through a lot of this stuff, but it's just a, it was just a lot of stuff that I, I had to get through. Um, sure, I could have broken down to smaller videos, um, but I think everything here was like interconnected, so there wasn't really a way to do that. With that being said, my children, I hope you learned something. And again, if you have any trouble, just leave me a message and I will hopefully be able to save you. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, I'm going to figure out how to solve these bugs and make things not garbage. <laughs> Alright children, thank you all for watching. Until next time, farewell.